जस्ट मेक श्योर आपको मेरी आवाज रख मान रही Assalamualaikum everyone and uh, I'm sorry for the delay. There were some technical disturbances at our end. However, the tutorial is a uh, very simple and self-explanatory, so you won't be having any troubles with it. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about the various symptoms that a person can get in uh, cases of. poisoning we we're not going to be talking about every single poison right now but only the ones that give the patient some very particular and peculiar symptoms that are easily recognizable and that can be easily uh, picked up by a medical legal officer or a simple doctor okay so these are the dermatological manifestations in cases of various poisons the first one we need to talk about is arsenic poison now it's a metallic poison okay or a metallic irritant i would say and the skin manifestations or the signs and symptoms that we see in a person with chronic arsenic poisoning develop over a long period of time okay so it's not like that okay a person gets exposed to arsenic one day and the other day he is going to start having the symptoms no not that's not like that it happens over a long period of time okay so there are particularly four uh, things that happens when a person gets exposed to arsenic over a long period of time now speaking of exposure what would be the exposure in uh, our country it's you it's very commonly seen in people who are drinking the well water especially in interior sin because it's not filtered it's not purified and uh, our soil has a lot of arsenic in it okay so that is a very common way a person can get exposed so you can you may be seen patients in your opds once you get exposed to uh, patients and patient dealing that people who come from into your sin may have these skin manifestations and you might be able to pick them up so try to learn them right now okay so the first one is a rain drop appearance of skin now it is just hyperpigmentation you would see some spots of hyperpigmentation which are due to excess melanin deposition which is termed as hypermelanosis okay that's fairly simple when uh, at a spot uh, on a skin there's a lot of melanin production that spot would get hyperpigmented and we have just named it as raindrop appearance because they slightly have a raindrop appearance to it okay the second uh, sign that we see are on nails okay the nail bed basically and they are called mise lines okay mise lines now these are transverse white bands transverse meaning they run from one corner to the other and there are white bands that you would be able to identify on a person's nails these are called mise lines then there's hyperkeratosis of skin of palms and soles hyperkeratosis meaning that the skin is thickened in simple terms okay their skin would be very rough it would be thickened they might have calluses a lot of calluses okay and uh, these are just because of the reaction of exposure to arsenic in their system okay? now the last uh thing is quite serious which is called a black foot disease now the mechanism behind it is not just plain melanin irritating the skin or that's causing hyperkeratosis or hyperpigmentation or simple white bands but it's fairly more serious that is that arsenic will cause vasoconstriction Okay. and vaso constriction in the lower limb area especially the feet of the patient would cause it to go into gangrene okay 
and that is called black foot disease and we've just termed it okay it's just plain gangrene due to a infection okay now there are some pictures now this is a, a common example of a woman who's drinking out of well water she uh, can very well get exposed to a lot of arsenic chronically because she's going to be drinking this water every day and uh, as a result of which can develop these skin manifestations okay now uh, the picture is not very clear because the man himself has a dark skin however if you look very closely you would see some spots circular or raindrop like spots on his back of hyperpigmentation these are the rain classic raindrop appearance that you see in arsenic poisoning i want you guys to appreciate it this is just hyperpigmentation due to local irritation caused by arsenic in the blood circulation okay now these are the main signs that we were talking about the transverse white bands across the nails okay and lastly hyperkeratosis you can see how thickened the soles and palms of this patient are there are certain calluses that are present and uh, you can see how badly this person is affected okay and lastly the black foot disease it is just a fancy term for a gangrenous foot which is due to loss of circulation to that particular body part all right uh, since there's no blood that is why the, this part of the body has uh, underwent gangrenous chain okay now i hope arsenic poisoning uh, is quite clear to you now let's move on to mercury poisoning now back in the days uh, let me tell you a story first it would help you remember it okay mercury poisoning is a uh, very rare nowadays because uh, we don't usually get exposed to mercury however back in the 20th century what uh, used to happen was that the mercury was very commonly used in teething powders as it was believed to be a painkiller or a pain relief uh, medicine and it was also used in vermicidal medications that were used for children okay so uh, like if a child was infested with worms they would just administer some mercury in an attempt to kill the worms okay it was also considered to be a bacteria bacteria sidle agent meaning that it would kill bacteria right so it was also used in nappy uh, uh, wash creams or nappy rashes creams so babies back in the 20th century were very heavily exposed to mercury now as a result of which they developed something called a pink disease now the term pink disease comes from the color of the hands and feet that the baby acquired okay they acquired a very dark stainish pinkish color on their hands and feet and that was the cause of the disease mainly the pink disease other disease other names for this disease were acrodynia infantile mercury poisoning or swift disease pink disease is very self explanatory so we just gave them a bit more terms okay acrodynia infantile mercury poisoning or swift disease now this is a picture of a child and he was chronically exposed to mercury and you can appreciate how pink or hyperemic his hands and feet are okay so it's just the color of it that's very prominent and would help us in identifying mercury poisoning okay now 
if uh, that was uh, an acute exposure as a result of the acute exposure the child developed this uh, hyperemic palms and soles uh, or pinkish palm and soles however if someone is chronically exposed to mercury mercury can act as an irritant okay it has irritant properties to it and when someone's in uh, chronically contact with mercury the skin is getting exposed to mercury they can develop something called ulcers okay and uh, these ulcers are very similar to like when someone gets in contact with corrosive okay mercury has a very similar action to corrosive i would say right however if someone has um, does not have direct contact with mercury but is involved in some factory like factory workers who are involved in uh, manufacturing thermometers or various other industrial products so they might commonly get exposed to mercury vapors and they might get in they might inhale them as well if they're not wearing proper protective equipments okay now if chronically they're inhaling those mercury vapors mercury is getting into their system and may produce a disease or uh, symptoms very similar to mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome or disease or simply kawasaki disease which it, it's a term that is not used currently we use mucocutaneous as a, a newer term for the disease but uh, if you can remember kawasaki was an older term okay now this disease was characterized by fever conjunctivitis reddish oral mucosa or congested oral mucosa whenever we use the term congested it means swollen and red okay so congestion of the oral mucosa skin rashes cervical lymphadenopathy and swelling of the extremities these were all symptoms of the kawasaki disease however a person who's chronically exposed to mercury vapors can also develop these symptoms and it will not be a result of uh, an immune reaction uh, as happens in the kawasaki disease if you can be far from your pathology i hope you guys uh, remember uh, why the kawasaki disease happens it's an autoimmune disease remember but in this case if someone develops all of these symptoms and is chronically exposed to mercury he is not having an autoimmune disease it's because of the chronic mercury exposure now this is the point where you realize the importance of history taking can you relate it if in the history taking you would have asked his occupation and he would have told you that well yeah i work in a factory uh, we make thermometers and stuff like that and it involves mercury and then you see all of these symptoms you won't go towards the diagnosis of mucocutaneous disease you're going to go towards the diagnosis of mercury poison right it's that simple so history is a very uh, important element that helps you to lead the diet lead to your diagnosis okay always remember that okay if a child is exposed to these mercury vapors they can have symptoms similar to scarlet fever okay uh all right so this is a child and he's having symptoms of kawasaki disease which is fever red eyes swollen hands and feet he's going to have skin rashes which will be widespread uh, his tongue and lips would be red his lips would be cracked uh, his oral mucosa would be uh, congested okay these are all the symptoms of kawasaki disease however these are also the symptoms 
if someone's chronically exposed to mercury vapors. Okay. All right. Then uh, let's talk about lead poisoning. Now, lead poisoning is also something that uh, we have somewhat overcome in the first world countries. However, it's still something that gets diagnosed very frequently in third world countries because we have not taken the protective measures that were needed to avoid lead poisoning up till today as well. Okay? Occupational health is something that's neglected in our country, and that is why we see such cases. Well, so let's talk about chronic lead poisoning. Now, lead has a, a very strong affection to liver, okay? And chronic lead exposure can lead to liver damage as a result of which the patient will develop jaundice. Now, always remember that jaundice is not a disease. It's a symptom that could indicate liver damage. Okay? So you would see liver damage, jaundice, as a result of which you would see the patient in jaundice. Then there's something called a Bertonian lie. Uh, when you're going to examine the oral cavity of such patients who are chronically exposed to lead, you're going to see a, a pigmented line between uh, the teeth and the gums. Okay? And it is due to deposition of lead itself. Okay? So let's get, lead gets deposited in these areas. And as a result of which, you would see this Bertonian line. This is not hyperpigmentation, this is lead itself. Okay, so if you're going to biopsy this place, you're going to find lead here. Okay? This is called a Bertonian line. Remember the classic names for it. Okay. All right. Now comes silver poisoning. Okay? Now, I recently watched a video where the man was uh, blue. He was completely blue and it is a permanent skin change. Uh, what happened was, uh, it, this, this is a real story. It was a real video. It was a documentary that I watched. And uh, his friend had some disease which he didn't tell in the interview. And uh, he just uh, part of helping his friend and uh, recognized that silver was, uh, you know, a treatment for it. In the, it was a myth, but he thought of just experimenting with it. So he just used to make a composition of silver along with some other fluids and he made his friend drink it and magically his friend recovered. Okay. Then um, he wasn't that much exposed during that period. However, later on, he developed some uh, disease himself in which he had a lot of joint pain. It was rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, he discovered again from herbal uh, remedies that silver can cure rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, you must know what he did next. He just, you know, started drinking that uh, silver portion mixed with all of the other herbs, but uh, predominantly that portion had silver in it. And he also started locally applying a silver composition uh, liquid to his rashes or the places where he had pain. Now, as a result of this exposure to silver, he turned blue, like literally blue. His skin was blue. 
and this condition is called argeria okay he's known as the blue guy and it is uh, very much affecting his mental health however it's not painful it's just plain discoloration of skin but it's permanent you cannot do anything about it once your skin turns blue okay? so chronic silver poisoning can lead to bluish discoloration of skin which is called argeria okay so this is what uh, the bluish discoloration looks like this man still has some normal spots on his face like his eyes and around his lips and chin but uh, if uh, he's chronically more exposed and you do not stop his exposure he would turn completely blue and this bluish discoloration due to silver uh, poisoning is called argeria all right okay nickel now nickel is a very common element used in uh, artificial jewels and is artificial jewelries uh, those belts that we that boys wear around their waists so it is classically known to cause allergies okay because uh, our skin is not very uh, in good terms with nickel okay so it causes it causes contact allergic dermatitis okay and uh, it happens where nickel comes in contact with the skin so where does it come in contact ear lobes very common because it's in the jewelry we we use breast for breast bands or watches that are made of nickel the lower abdomen where the uh, there's the jeans stud that has nickel in it even the belt um, no knuckle has nickel in it okay so the symptoms of allergic derm dermatitis would be redness itchiness even blistering if it's very severe okay and if chronically exposed like uh, you're not stopping the exposure the skin would become dry and thickened and even pigmented this is called chronic dermatitis so for acute it would be just redness inflammation uh, itchiness would be there some slight blistering however if you do not remove the exposure it would lead to thickened and dry and pigmented skin okay and so this is someone who was wearing a belt around his tummy and uh, he developed the nickel allergy allergy to nickel as a result of wearing some earrings okay so let's talk about another one pallium okay so the classic symptom sorry the classic symptom that pallium produces is alopecia remember that alopecia pallium pallium alopecia simple as that so it would have a sudden hair loss okay and the alopecia is diffused it's not like patchy alopecia but diffuse and sudden so these are the classic signs that would guide you towards pallium poisoning now hair loss is due to atrophy of the hair follicles okay and is not just uh related to the scalp but even to the eyelashes the eyebrows and even the hairs on your limbs okay um classically the axillary regions are less affected and even hair discoloration may also occur so the classic symptom would be alopecia however there are certain other dermatological features uh, rashes redness some dryness of the palms and sole leading to scaling and some pustular eruptions on the face which are acne like okay however these are not that prominent the very prominent feature that the patient would come in with would be alopecia 
okay? And it would be diffuse, it would be sudden, it would involve all of your body parts. Sometimes the axilla is spared. However, sometimes it won't be spared. It would be just hair loss all across the body. When there's sudden severe hair loss, to such an extent, think of thallium, okay? And uh, then there is, you would also see some transverse white lines that we saw with arsenic poisoning in the start. And thallium can also give you that, okay? So this is the alopecia that we were talking about with thallium. Uh, this has just begun and you can see it's starting to, you know, get hold of his entire scalp. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, let's talk about cirrhosis. This is a very serious topic. And uh, there are many cases, sadly, sadly, there are many cases that are reported in our country where, uh, where cases are there of acid flowing, especially on women. It's very heart-wrenching for me to talk about as these victims are not only just affected on the skin, but it serves them to be a lifelong disability. They cannot face the society. Their mental health is just blown off. And it takes a toll on their mental and physical health and social well-being as well. So it's called vitriolage. The act of throwing acid or a very strong corrosive is called vitriolage, right? Most commonly, it's thrown on the face and uh, the most common agent that's used is sulfuric acid. It is punishable. There is a law for it in our country. However, this is not helping it to stop the crime and uh, according to the Kisas and the ordinance it's uh, classified under which means an injury that causes a loss of function okay means an injury that causes a loss in function okay so this is sadly a victim of the tillage See the permanent scarring, and the skin damage that she has gained, which sadly will not be cured. Even after extensive plastic surgeries, the face does not get to a normal state. Okay, so after that, a um, very serious note. There is organophosphorus poisoning or in poisoning from insecticides. So whenever the skin gets exposed to such compounds, it would develop some redness, some slight inflammation, and less strain. Okay. All right, barbiturates. Now, with barbiturates, this is a pharmacological agent. And uh, it is used in epilepsy, in anesthesia. Some people develop certain skin changes, and uh, these are blisters and bulla. Now, there is a difference between a blister and a bulla. A blister can be easily ruptured because the topmost part is just the epithelium. Uh, sorry, the topmost layer of the epithelium. Whereas for bulla, it uh, involves the entire epithelium okay, and the dermis as well. It's between the ep uh, dermis and the epiderm. Okay? So a bulla is very tense. You cannot easily rupture it because uh, it's the 
epidermis and the epidermis, whereas the blisters, they're just in the epidermis, okay? So as for the pathogenesis of this uh, bulla or blister formation, it is unknown. We don't know exactly why certain people develop these blisters or bulla. However, when we biopsy the bulla, we find necrosis of the crying red glands. Okay? Now, there is another theory that suggests that uh, due to low blood flow uh, or the vasoactive action, these bulla develops, or even there might be some immune reactions that might be involved in these bulla formations. So there are certain theories behind it. Some say that it's due to infection. Some say there's immune, uh, they're immune mediated. Uh, I searched for it online and I found it that most of the people suggest some immune mediated mechanism behind it. Yeah. So this is a blister. Blister scan. Now these are some certain drugs, cocaine and in cocaine. Uh, this is not a thing that you would see, but the patient would complain of. Okay, and this symptom is called Magnan's symptom. So what it is, it's the creeping, creepy feeling that some insect or, or something just walking over their skin. Okay, uh, this is just pure hallucination or tactile hallucination. And uh, it has nothing to do with the life. The patient just experiences it uh, when they do not get okay. okay? Then there's ergotism. In chronic ergot poisoning, you feel as if uh, there's a very intense burning sensation on the inside as well and on the outside. And this is called St. Anthony Spire. Like the, per the patient would actually tell you that I feel like my body's on fire. I feel burning and I feel pain, okay? Then there's the marking nut or semi-carpus anacardium. Now it's very commonly used in washing a, uh, Washing industries, or uh, uh, what do you call them? Washermen who pick up clothes from your houses and they wash them in the laundries and they fold and iron them and get them back to you. Even the dry cleaners, they use this marking nut or semi-carpus anacardium and they can cause what's called an artificial bruise. Okay? The discoloration that or the stain that they give to the skin is, can be very easily, uh, you know, confused with a real bruise. Now, what's the medical legal importance of it? Someone can just use this marking nut and uh, they can fake that someone had beaten them, they've got into some fall, they've got into some fight, and they were badly bruised and injured. However, it would be just the marking nut and not a bruise. So we need to differentiate between a true bruise and an artificial bruise, okay? So as for a true bruise, you would know that it's due to trauma, the location can be anywhere. There won't be any blistering because a bruise is just a bruise, okay? And a bruise heals over time, right? So you would see some color changes over time, right? However, if it's a fake bruise, which is used by, uh, which is caused by using a marking nut, you would be seeing this on some accessible body parts, okay? Where the person can reach, okay? There would be some blistering and even vesications because of the local irritant effect. There would be no color changes. Why? Because it's not a true bruise. It would just remain as it is. 
there would be some itching present. Okay? As a result of itching, you might also see some marks of scratch. Okay? And uh, when you're going to examine that root, you would find chemical in the Okay. Okay, so we're just uh, nearing the end. Stay with me, guys. Let's talk about the war gases. Okay, or these are called vesicants of blistering gases as well. Okay, the first gas is called mustard gas, or the fancy name for it is dichloroethyl sulfide, yellow cross, and lewisite. Okay. So it's a very, very intense vesicant, meaning that when someone's exposed to this gas, uh, they develop uh, blistering, okay? And vesicles all over their body, okay? And they suffer immediately, right? So within 24 hours of exposure, victims experience intense itching and skin itch which gradually turns into large blisters with fluid filled and uh, this is just because of mustard agent getting in contact with the skin. The, the soldier from World War I and he was exposed to this mustard gas and you can see the bulla that are formed on his neck, armpits and hands. Yeah. These are blisters again. That's it. Thank you so much. And uh, I would stop sharing now. Uh, I hope you guys ha don't have any questions. And if so, you can type it in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, you didn't get the idea of nothing. Uh, it's well, it's something called a monkey nut. Uh, it's a small stone like thing, and uh, you can use it to clean clothes. However, it also stains skin. Okay. And uh, the stain that it produces on the skin looks very similar to a bruise. Okay. A bruise, I hope you know what a bruise is. So we need to differentiate on medical legal terms that whether it's a real bruise or it's used, it's a fake bruise, which is mar which is just used with those marking nuts. Okay. I hope you get the idea. Okay, who are the people who get exposed to thallium? All right, let me answer you that. I have to search myself, I'm very sorry. So, sometimes we don't know all the answers, right? And we need to find out. Helium exposures. Okay, so eating food contaminated with thallium can be a major source of exposure for most people. Breathing workplace air in industries that use thallium, smoking cigarettes, living near hazardous waste sites can cause thallium exposures. Okay, so I hope. Yep, I searched it too. <laughs> I was just reading it from Google. I hope you got your answer, Noor. Anyone else with any questions? Or we can just call it off. Uh, okay, any more questions, guys? I hope you remember something from today's lecture. It was pretty lengthy, I admit. But uh, try to remember the classic signs for each of the poisonings and you will be good to go. Okay, So I'm going to be signing off now. I hope there are no more questions. Thank you so much. And uh, Allah, stay safe.